Oh man, any any primers in the chat? Any prime gamings in the chat? Ah, we'll get some of you one day with that ad, but I guess it won't be today. But we do have someone right here, right now, in the studio. He's the founder of Gamers Outreach and a little bit of a saucier organization on the side. Everybody, give it up for Zach Wago! What is going on, Zach? Thank you so much for joining me here in the studio today. I'm glad you you made it on time. Uh, there, for those of you at home who didn't know, behind the scenes there was a bit of a uh, a snack a snack incident where Zach needed to go eat something real quick before he came on the show. But thankfully, he got back in time and made it to the studio. What what did you end up getting? I uh, grabbed a little bit of sushi. Nice. I <laughs> <laughs> grabbed some dinner. What what kind of rolls are you into? What's your uh, what's your sushi order? Man, I, I keep it pretty basic to be honest. I usually go with a rainbow roll, eel roll, get the miso soup on the side, steamed dumplings if they've got them. You know, straightforward stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's a big order right there. That's that's pretty solid. It's, it's funny. I, people tell me I, I like that I eat a lot, and I I don't know. I, I feel like I, I put it down, man. I'm here. I, I love good food. <laughs> One of the best things in life, I think, is to uh, enjoy a great meal with friends. So I, I think you are absolutely right about that. I mean, you mentioned uh, also as well before the show that you were on the East Coast. You're normally over on the West Coast. What are you doing on the East? Yeah, I'm on a little tour right now. Uh, so I was in Michigan. Uh, tomorrow I'm actually going to be in Indianapolis. Uh, a buddy of mine is like on a, a racing team, and um, he's driving at uh, a speedway tomorrow, so I'm going to kind of go support him. Uh, and then I'll be back in Los Angeles, I think. No, I'll be in Vegas for the Esports Business Summit, and then I'll be back in Los Angeles. So the tour is almost over. I mean, you get to travel around the country, see some racing. I, I've seen a few pictures of you in, like, the racing outfit. Have you done some racing yourself? But also there was another one where you were in, like, it was like a go-kart, but you had the full yeah. the full outfit. <laughs> Yeah, I'm on this karting team in Los Angeles, uh, so it's it's pretty serious. I, I'll admit that I'm probably the worst driver on the team, <laughs> in all truthfulness. Uh, it's just a fun hobby for me. Um, the karts go like 70 to 90 miles an hour, depending on what you're driving, though. Yeah, so it's like a lot of people may not realize, but go-karting is kind of like the bedrock of the racing world. So if someone is a young child and they have interest, or if you're an adult and you have interest in... <laughs> Um, learning to drive, learning to race, go karting is pretty much where everyone gets started. All the Formula One drivers started karting at some point. Um, I mean, they, the majority of people who are professional drivers start by karting. So um, it's very competitive. I mean, a lot of professional drivers will still continue to kart. Um, and actually, like, I sound a little bit like a name dropper, but there's this guy, Jensen Button, who is uh, the 2009 Formula One world champion. He uh, is actually on our karting team. He comes out pretty regularly um, to drive with everybody. So that, in my defense, I'm the worst driver, but like all <laughs> the guys that are on my team are like aspiring to become professional or have made it into the pro scene and, and just like to kart once in a while. So anywho, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good fun. And my dad, like um, this comes up a lot in conversation just because he was such a big influence, but my dad used to build Indy cars back in the day. So when I was a kid, we would go to a lot of racetracks and, that was like the first thing I wanted to do when I grew up was like be a race car driver. So anyway, that's a long winded anecdote personally, uh, just a fun hobby, but yeah, I try to try to represent our team when it comes up. Well, I mean, you know, that's exactly what we're looking for here on late night with Los long winded anecdotes about interesting people and some occasional name drops as well. I mean, that's, that's awesome. I didn't know that go-karting was the link from, I guess, casual to professional racing. How did you, uh, how did you link up with your team or your group? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I think racing, first off, racing is such a remarkable activity. Uh, the engineering that's required to build race cars is um, captivating, I think, in a lot of ways. And then to drive is very poetic, I feel. Um, I used to love just sort of, I mean, this is maybe bad to admit, but I had this like Camaro when I was a bit younger. Uh, I was like this convertible, and I would intentionally try to find empty roads just to act belligerent on. And then a buddy <laughs> of mine, who uh, is really into motorsports, he's like acquainted with this uh, this karting team that I'm on. And he was like, you know, man, if you're you know into going on these road trips, 
you should think about like actually going to a track and doing it for real. And karting is a really great way to learn some of the basics. So that sounded like a fun idea to me. And, uh, you know, funny enough, when I was a kid, I actually always wanted to have a go-kart, but my dad, despite him like being in the scene, uh, wasn't about it. He, in his defense, I think like, you know, to be a parent and like sign your kid up for karting is kind of <laughs> sort of obnoxious and expensive. Uh, you have to like drag this cart around. You kind of have to be a mechanic for your kid and like fix the cart when something goes wrong. Uh, and racing parents are pretty serious too. I mean, it's probably like hockey parents, but like a little bit at a bit of a, a, a higher level even just because of uh, some, some of my, how much hands-on work you have to do. Um, but yeah, so I realized, you know, I'm an adult now. I can do what I want. Uh, I joined this karting team in LA, and uh, I will brag about our karting team whenever I get the chance because the guy who owns it, uh, Phil Giebler, he actually used to test drive Formula One cars, and he has raced in the Indy 500 a couple times, which is like a really uh, prestigious race for those who aren't acquainted with the racing world. Um, and was rookie of the year one of the years when he competed. So he's like the real deal. Like he's like super connected. And then he also distributes uh, go karts for Daniel Ricardo, who people might know from like the Netflix, uh, or if you just watch F1, obviously Ricardo is like you know a big name. Um, but also, if you've like watched the Netflix series Drive to Survive, uh, he's featured pretty prominently as well. So uh, anyway, Phil is our team owner. He's kind of like the sheriff in the karting world. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm probably the worst driver on the team, honestly, <laughs> with, with all the guys around me. So it's just fun. It's pretty cool. Well, I mean, you're a converted street racer. So, you know, I guess solo street racer, if you're just going on what you would call a road trip as uh, just ripping it down a freeway. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just love I love the freedom of driving. To me, there's something very honest about it. Like when you get on a track, everyone is there to do the same thing. There are no questions about, you know, what's going on. It's like, we're here to win the race. And, um, and I just, I just love it. I think it's so relaxing. It's very meditative. Uh, I love, you know, going on these like long drives and listening to music as well. So I see in the chat, someone says karting is hella expensive. Uh, that's, that's, it, I guess it depends on your point of view. I mean, karting to me is very similar to snowboarding. Like once you buy your snowboard and have your gear, um, you know, maybe you buy your like season passes or whatever each year, but I, I think karting is actually even less expensive than snowboarding. I mean, your cart is maybe two to three grand when you buy it initially. I mean, depending on what sort of cart you get, they can be a bit higher. Um, but then when you go to the track, it's maybe like a hundred bucks each time you go. So, um, at least our team and, and Phil, our team owner, like stores everything for us. So it's not too crazy. I mean, it's, it's definitely less money than snowboarding. Um, and, uh, and if you live in a warm climate, you can do it year round. So it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, uh, I have never done, I've actually, I've snowboarded once and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I should get into it. And I told myself that like 15 times and now I'm like, yeah, I, I don't really care about it too much. <laughs> really? So did you go the one time? Did you enjoy it? Oh yeah. No, I had a blast. It was fun, yeah. but, uh, I just never made the commitment to do it and it doesn't interest me that much to go out and just do it. So I'm like, uh. That that sure. could that could just stay on the back burner, you know. It doesn't really matter too much. It's not like one yeah. of my passions that I'm just like, oh, I gotta wait one day. I'll do it. It's kind of just a feeling of, eh, I don't really care too much. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. When you when you went snowboarding, did you take lessons? Um, I think I went with my siblings, and it was such a long time ago. It was such a long time ago. Uh, I I rented a board, and they're just like, okay, go. <laughs> Just like down yeah. a down an easy hill, go. You're, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I so the reason I'm asking is um, I can relate to this a bit. I also I, I didn't go snowboarding for the longest time until recently, and also went with a couple friends. And the first day is very similar to your experience. Uh, <laughs> they they basically were just like they were the worst teachers to be honest. They they were like here, get on the board. You've got to every, every the way they explained everything just didn't quite make sense and it wasn't at least it wasn't clicking with me and i spent most of my day falling over and unstrapping myself from the board to strap myself back in but lessons um the next day i did lessons and that changed everything and uh i can't wait to go back it was really i think a, a much more fun once i kind of knew <laughs> what i was doing so if it's any encouragement you might might be interesting to give it a second try 
uh, if you get the chance. I'll I'll look into it. <laughs> but let's talk about uh, one of the events that are on the latter half of your trip, the uh, the Games Business Convention, and what are you going to do there, and why are you there? Tell me about the the reason you became a uh, a gaming business person and and gamers outreach. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll be attending this event, the Esports Business Summit. It's happening uh, next week, as of this show recording. Um, I have to like look at my phone to remember what is the date today. Uh, so I think like October eighteenth, nineteenth ish, um, and I'll be representing Gamers Outreach. So I. 14 years ago, started this organization, uh, Gamers Outreach, with a focus to help make play more accessible inside hospitals. So fast forward a number of years, our whole intent is to help make sure entertainment is readily available to kids and families while they're receiving care. And we make entertainment available through video games. Why video games? Well, it turns out that in a lot of hospitals, there is a big focus on research and treatment, but oftentimes quality of life takes a backseat. And quality of life is just, in summary, all the things that happen in between times you might be seeing a doctor or recovering. So, um, you know, some kids that are in the hospital, uh, they're without access to their friends, they maybe can't physically leave their rooms, so they're unable to really have any sort of recreation. But with video games, we can basically make play possible at scale. A nine-year-old has just as much fun on an Xbox as a 19-year-old does in hospitals, right? So gaming is really unique in that unlike, say, toys or books or playrooms, which are all great, those things are limited uh, by some either you know sort of physical accessibility or relevance to a child. Whereas video games are, are different in that they can be made available to all kids simultaneously if a hospital has the equipment and is able to manage all those devices. So slightly long-winded explanation, but uh, that's kind of why I'm going to Esports Business Summit. Uh, I'm going out there. It's a, a conference that brings together folks from the esports landscape and uh, Gamers Outreach. We do quite a bit of work with uh, various folks in the esports scene. More broadly, we do a lot of work with folks in the video game industry. Uh, I like to think that our organization kind of has one foot in the video game industry and one foot in the world of healthcare. And we get a lot of support from folks in gaming to help enable the work that we do in hospitals. So uh, yeah, we'll be at Esports Business Summit for a couple of days representing the cause. Uh, I think I'm on a panel with a couple other people uh, chatting about how video games and esports teams can make a uh, social impact. Um, and of course, I'm coming at that with the angle of seeing all the incredible work being done in hospitals. So uh, yeah, that's that's a little bit of a nutshell of what Gamers Outreach is and, and what we're up to at the Esports Business Summit. Well, you've come incredibly far to have such a, a, a big reach across the country and helping so many children get access to games. But let's take it back all the way to the beginning in Celine High School. Talk to me about the first ever event that the, uh, I guess, the precursor of Gamers Outreach had. Yeah, and it, it's amazing, right? At Gamers Outreach, really thanks to the involvement of a lot of people in the community, we're now supporting devices in uh, over 230 hospitals, primarily in the U.S. And we estimate all, across all those devices we're enabling somewhere between two to 2.5 million play sessions each year for kids and families. So a play session is basically any time a kid puts a hand on one of our devices and, and plays video games. So sometimes we might have an instance where we're working with like the same kid uh, over the course of a week, you know, who's in the hospital and maybe each day he gets to have a turn with some of the video games we've installed. Other times, a uh, some of our devices might exist in a playroom and maybe 20 different kids are coming in through the day. So we basically kind of come up that, with that number just based on surveys we do with hospitals where we ask them, you know, on average, how many kids do you think per day are using our equipment? And then they come back to us and we try to check up like once a year or so to just make sure that number is accurate. Um, 
where did we start? Wow, how did all this begin? Well, I was a high school student, so as mentioned, about 14 years ago, <laughs> uh, I had actually um, become sick. I was under the weather my like junior year, had mono over the summer, and missed a bunch of sports practice. Wasn't bad enough where I was like in the hospital or anything, but um, ended up just staying inside a lot. Now, I had grown up playing video games. Um, I mentioned my dad earlier. Uh, and the reason he was relevant is um, he was a computer science major and always had games around the house. And because of him, really, my younger brother and I grew up in a very like gamer-friendly environment. Uh, he was playing games, and, and that sort of became like uh, a pastime consistently in the background on top of school and like, you know, sports and whatnot, like regular activities, right, throughout, throughout growing up. Um, but this particular summer, I, I, I was stuck inside. So I, I ended up getting really good at Mortal Kombat Deception, which was like the first Mortal Kombat where you could sign online and compete against other people through the internet. And this is like my one brag to like any sort of esports fame. I ended up breaking into like the top 40 out of 30,000 some players online of uh, Mortal Kombat. So these leaderboards and I had like thousands of games logged. I had this like journal where I was like keeping track of combos from other characters, things to look out for. Who was your main? And I used to play Raiden. So Raiden was like my main and um, Baraka was like my backup. Uh, and um, I liked Raiden because he had this like teleport uh like move where he you could like quickly go behind other. I just felt like he was more mobile. Like of, of the characters, he was the one I kind of enjoyed con like controlling the most. Um, and I still remember some of the combos, like square, square, triangle, back, L one. You know, and like it's funny. Um, I, so I would, I would just put a ton of time in this game. Selfishly wanted to brag to my friends about how good I had gotten in Mortal Kombat. So when I got <laughs> back to school. I like developed an interest in hosting video game tournaments. I was like, guys, I, I had seen some television commercial, um, or not television commercial, like a, a show. MTV had this MTV episode. True Life with yeah, uh, so remember, T squared. Yep, yeah, they did an episode on T squared, and at the time, I never heard of like Major League Gaming. Right, I, I wasn't familiar. I didn't realize that there were esports tournaments in the world, and I remember seeing this television episode and being really amazed and thinking to myself, like, wow, this is super cool. I wonder if I could do something like this at my high school. And that's what kind of led to conversations happening around wanting to organize a video game tournament at my high school. I, I ended up coming back my junior year, was really excited about this idea of like getting my friends together to compete, especially because at that time, every day at the lunch table, kids would come back and talk about how much, um, you know, how, how much how much they dominated the night before playing some online game, right? People were bragging all the time. And I just thought it'd be fun to, like, give my friends the chance to, like, really put their money where their mouths were. So <laughs> um, it just so happened, though, nobody was really interested in Mortal Kombat. Halo was the popular game at that time. Halo 2 was crazy popular. And um, what ended up starting out as, like, oh, let's do this Mortal Kombat tournament evolved to a uh, Halo tournament for my friends and I. So... Um, anyway, I'm getting a little long-winded on the origin, but long story short, I organized this tournament and had a few hundred kids in the local community sign up. So I had gone around to like local rival high schools and was putting flyers in people's windshields. I had rented the lunchroom at my school. I convinced a bunch of my friends to like let me borrow their Xboxes and televisions uh, so that we could have like the equipment ready for when people showed up to this tournament. And you know, did all this work as a young person trying to plan an event. It was really our our area's first ever esports tournament um and esports i don't even think was really a word at the time it was just look like competitive gaming it just so happened in the midst of planning i thought it would be a good idea to invite um some sort of security officer a parent to help chaperone the event because i was inviting like i mean there were hundreds of kids coming from my rival high schools right to compete in this halo tournament I don't, you know, and I just felt like it was the responsible thing to, you know, have some oversight while we were managing this event. So my mom recommended I call like our local public safety department. And it just so happened the person who picked up the phone belonged to this organization that uh, goes around and educates parents about content and movies, music, and games. And when oh. you, heard, <laughs> you can kind of like understand where this is going. When, 
when he heard my friends and I were interested in organizing a Halo tournament at our high school, he was like, wow, I'm kind of surprised your school is letting you host a Halo tournament. Like, are you aware Halo is an M-rated game? Like, it's interesting that high school kids are absorbing this sort of content. And I was like, well, listen, man, I'm, I'm not looking for your opinion. I just want to host a Halo <laughs> tournament. I, I want to be... Do you have, like, a T-shirt, security guy, like, an intern, someone who needs to put some hours in that can, like, walk by? Yeah, we're just trying to, like, you know, be responsible. Because, you know, at the same time, too, like, first off, all of us have, I I don't know, it might be less prevalent nowadays, but, like, at the time, I'd grown up with all these negative stereotypes around games, the video game community. Anytime there was a shooting, it was a matter of time before there was an expert who would get on the news and blame it on video games, right? Now, my opinion is, look, you know, if you want to talk about real acts of violence, there are probably, there's probably a healthy list of other topics to discuss before you get to video games. I mean, if, if, if someone that I was close with had passed away in a shooting and another person came up to me and said, wow, it's really too bad that all these kids are playing these violent video games nowadays and this happened, I would be furious. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, let's talk about, like, a list of other things before we get to the topic of video games. Um, that's just my own opinion on the topic. Um, now, uh, aside from that, um, you know, when we start looking at, um, you know, so aside from that, the the topic of you know what happened, you know, the the, the sort of uh, discussion in that time, um, you know, you know, I had always grown up with like teachers and coaches giving me flack for how you know much I love video games. So to hear this police officer basically say, hey, you know, um, I'm not really a fan of you doing this, just to me, like, it, it kind of triggered me a bit at the time as a gamer. Um, and I, I forgot the point for it that I was going to make in a second. But um, I was also going to mention that I had a class, I had a film as literature class, where we watched Blow, The Godfather, movies that arguably have content way more mature than Halo, I would argue. And it was as easy as like getting a parental consent form, uh, you know, to, to watch those movies at my school. So there wasn't really anything that we were doing that was different than sort of the norm. Um, and it wasn't that this officer had any sort of concern around the safety or, you know, uh, precautions we were taking of on our event. He literally just disagreed with the subject matter. So again, sort of some long-winded context there, but he ends up saying, hey, let me call you guys back. I'll let you know if I have an officer. And instead calls our school district superintendent. And he tells her, listen, I don't know if you're aware of this. There's this kid, Zach, he's organizing a Halo tournament. It's my opinion that video games like Halo are corrupting the minds of America's youth. Kids are training themselves to kill playing these violent video games. And because of that, this event is a hazard to public safety. You've got all these teenagers from rival high schools coming by. I don't think it's appropriate this sort of event happens on your campus. My superintendent gets this phone call. She has no idea what's going on. She doesn't really know anything about video games. Um, and there's a bunch of other nuances of this story that kind of created this like perfect storm for everything that was happening at the time in my community. Uh, it just so happened we had a superintendent that ended up being... Uh, 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 or basically ended up resigning from the district, uh, or I think she was you know, fired. So there's like a little bit of like political drama happening too in the background that ended up causing my event to be canceled. All the teenagers who had signed up being super frustrated about it. Me being frustrated as a lifelong video game enthusiast to the extent that I decided it would be a good idea to organize a new event for charity to at least demonstrate the positive things that happen when us gamers get together. Like, again, as mentioned, I grew up with all these negative stereotypes around games. I've never really believed them, though. People would say things like, oh, you know, games make you antisocial. I don't see it that way at all. I, I play games to socialize. Like, when I hop online, heck, we're talking right now on Twitch, right? Like, <laughs> I, Carlos, I've never met you, right? But it's through... Nope, through yeah. Network. Well, we have now. We have now. Now we're, now we're becoming best friends. But, you know, <laughs> it's through these networks we've created. Games are an activity atop these networks that have been built online. Uh, and they're a way for people to interact. I mean, I end up... I chat with my younger brother. He lives across the country. You know, I could pick up the phone and call him, and we would probably catch up in like 20 minutes. 
but I can play video games with them and we spend two hours together. So I, I see games as being additive to life, not an escape from it. I know people like to refer to games as like a source of escapism, and I think most people mean well by that, but um, and purely by definition, that's that's what they are in some ways. But I I don't like to use that word personally because I, I see when I play games, I'm not trying to escape from anything. I enjoy life. Life is great. I I see games as being additive to my life. Like when I play games, it's it's an enriching experience, right? You can experience story, you can experience you know uh, social interactions, etc. So, um, anywho, all that to say that we ended up organizing a new event for charity, and it just so happened my local newspaper ran a story about our tournament being canceled, and they kind of did so with like this angle. Local teens try to do something productive, but get shut down by the man. And <laughs> someone uploaded that story to this website, Dig, back in the day, which was kind of like the precursor to Reddit in some ways. Oh, I remember uh, in the, the annals of internet history, Dig. Yes, Evan Rose, <laughs> I think that was like his first big, big company. And um, we went viral on the internet for that time, and a bunch of people in the, like, the larger video game industry found out. So... I, and at the time, I, my knowledge of the gaming industry was pretty limited. I mean, whatever I would read in magazines, right, going to my local GameStop, I really didn't have the awareness of, like, the broader industry. I was kind of like, it's like when Luke Skywalker is, like, stuck on Tatooine as a, a moisture farmer, right? It's like, all right, well, uh, you know, like, he hasn't, he's not, you're not familiar yet with the, 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 the broader world, the broader universe that exists. Um, there were some people in the video game industry that ended up reaching out, which was really encouraging. Uh, Marty O'Donnell from, uh, you know, the, he's the guy who composed the music in the Halo series, actually wrote a letter to our local newspaper and totally stuck up for us. He literally wrote, uh, who are these people in your community protecting the, 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 the moral high ground of your society? Bungie Studios will pay Zach and his friends any money they lost trying to put this tournament together. Uh, and he's like, I challenge anyone to find content in Halo that's worse than what you see on primetime television. I should know. I put the audio in the game. So, like, <laughs> Marty, like, just came to bat for us, which was amazing. And I was super encouraged by that. You know, like, I, as again, when you're 16, 17 years old organizing something like that, it's, it's a big deal, right? You spend months of your life doing this, months of, of your life at that time seemed like an eternity. And uh, we were all really excited about it. Uh, and, you know, our event got, got canceled. But thankfully, it ended up being for the better. We organized a new event for charity called Gamers for Giving. Uh, fast forward now, it's like an annual event we host for Gamers Outreach. And in the process of evaluating charitable causes, I discovered my local hospital was having a hard time providing kids with activities. Now, as a video game enthusiast, it just seemed obvious. Like, well, why don't we give the kids video games? Like, you, you need to provide these kids with something to do. Let's let's make video games available for kids in your hospital. Then it became, okay, well, if we're gonna buy you guys video games, how do we make sure you can manage them easily? Because the hospital said, you know, look, that sounds like a great idea. And again, at the time, maybe you could buy us some PlayStation Portables, some Game Boys, and we could take those room to room. So I started touring the hospital. I actually started like just visiting the hospital, getting into the team. We started volunteering. So we could try to, like, we, we really became enthusiastic about making a real impact that was going to last for this particular hospital. Uh, because I started learning, you know, even if you buy a bunch of handheld devices for a hospital, it's usually a matter of time before they get lost or stolen or something happens. Like, and it's not a fault on the hospital. It's not like an indictment on hospital staff. Sometimes it's as easy as like you give a kid a device, he uses it, he or she uses it for a week, and then they go home with it. They think it's theirs. So like, oh, I'm just going to leave. Um, or things get lost, right? I mean, you have hundreds and thousands of kids coming through hospital doors each year. Uh, it's very easy for things to be missing, break down. Somebody has to manage that equipment. So I thought, well, what if we could give you something that like allowed you to keep track of your existing devices? And this is how our first program came into existence. We call it Project Go-Kart. And our organization constructs these portable video game kiosks that are equipped with an Xbox or a PlayStation, a monitor. We install an assortment of games. And these help ensure video games are mobile and secure in a hospital. So um, we call them go-karts, just an acronym, Gamers Outreach Cart. Does that have anything to do with your love for karting? 
You know, in some ways, yeah, the, the, the gaming cart came before the actual go-karting, but yeah, the racing pun, we have all sorts of racing puns within Gamers Outreach, so it might have been a subliminal thing when we when we started the initiative. Um, but yeah, that does create a little bit of confusion. Sometimes we'll talk to hospitals and we'll tell them, yes, hi, we'd like to donate a go-kart to your hospital. Oh, is this like a real go-kart? What What's going on? I'm like, uh, <laughs> We're not going to have our kids racing down the halls in a go-kart. What are you, what are you doing, Zach? <laughs> Right, right. Is this like, are, are we going to be able to fit this? I don't know. And then we have to explain. No, it's uh, it's 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 a video game kiosk. Um, so I think that conversation, I think it kind of works in our favor. Uh, it kind of becomes like a a, a discussion top, excuse me, a discussion topic. Um, but yeah, that's to say we uh, we build these video game kiosks. We have built uh, quite a few over the years, and they're rolling around in hospitals all around the country. So we started, though, at, at Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We ran this event, Gamers for Giving, used the money to help bring video games into the hospital. And um, soon after, a neighboring hospital found out what we were doing and asked for support. And then at that time, I was starting to do random contract gigs in the video game industry. So Gamers Outreach, it's been around for 14 years, but like the first six or seven years, it was really like more of a passion project. You know, I, on a personal level, I felt that it was fun. It was doing good in the community. Um, I enjoyed doing it. It was, uh, it, you know, it, it didn't seem like there was any sort of good reason to, to stop. Um, and as long as it didn't, like, my, my feeling was as long as it didn't interrupt college or interrupt, you know, my, my sort of, like, work life that it was starting to, you know, become a thing, uh, we should keep doing it. It's cool. Um, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, I suppose, it, it did end up interrupting my life. Uh, we had this instance, I think, I think the breaking point was we had this instance where somebody tried donating 900 Xbox consoles to us, and the semi-truck, like, showed up at my parents' house uh, trying to unload pallets of consoles. <laughs> And mind you, we had already amassed like probably five or 6,000 video games and donations from my, in my parents' basement. So my parents through all of this have been like acting as the, like they've been sort of in the background all these years as like the very supportive, uh, like they've been the very, very encouraging support characters in the background. Um, and when we had amassed all these video games, I mean, it literally looked like like the storage room of a Best Buy, right? When those uh, like, when those pallets arrived, did they call you up like Zach? You got to take care of this, man. We can't we can't do this anymore. Yeah, well, that was kind of what happened. And my parents were basically like, "Look, you know, you're not going to put all these Xboxes in the basement. This is the last straw." <laughs> and uh, that, that, I like to joke that was the day we got kicked out of my parents' basement, uh, <laughs> and we had to get like an actual storage unit and move that stuff there. It also so happened to be the day. Um, at that time, I actually had a job at Corsair, and we had a product launch that same day. We were launching like a new mice and a new mouse or a new keyboard, if I remember. And so, on one hand, my boss was like depending on me to help with like some of the marketing material and getting some things out to you know get this product into the world. On the other hand, my parents are calling me like Zach. There's a semi. You need to like find a place to put these Xboxes. So I was trying to kind of live in both of those worlds. And um, it just was really difficult. I, I it got to a point where like the organization was like in a very serious way interrupting my ability to perform at my job. And, and thankfully, my boss, you know, there I, I mean, he still says this. There, there weren't any performance issues necessarily, but I knew I wasn't. I, I knew I was risking like some things slipping through the cracks, and it also just felt like I was compelled to work on it, like intuitively it felt like what I wanted to be spending my time doing. I'm, I'm very concerned generally with having a sense of purpose um, in the way that I live and the, the things that I like to, uh, to do day to day. Um, and to me, as a lifelong gamer, it just seems like there's this opportunity for us as video game enthusiasts to apply all this knowledge we've acquired over the years in a way that is making a major impact in the hospital environment and in people's lives in a very uh, 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 serious way. Um, and it's kind of ironic, too, because you consider, like, all the stereotypes around games. Like, actually, it turns out we are the only ones who have the knowledge to adequately deploy games in hospitals and make those impacts. So um, this is our time to step up to the plate is the way I see it. So... Yeah, I, I, I decided at that, that point to quit my job. 
Uh, live at home with my parents for a bit. I didn't want to compromise the integrity of our program. So Gamers Outreach was still at the point where we were raising money to support our program. So it didn't necessarily have money to like support a staff. So I um, just committed myself to trying to build that up, uh, trying to raise money, trying to raise the funds to where we could do both. Um, and now we have uh, a small team. We all work remotely around the country. Um, I think we're up to like 12 or 13 people full time. And then we've got um, a handful of contractors we work with for various projects and then a couple hundred volunteers as well around the country who are like pretty active in like helping to uh, provide support when it's needed. So uh, that's where uh, that's where it's at. We're now we're, we're we're trying to basically build a world where one day we'll all look back and ask ourselves, remember when hospitals didn't have video games? It seems so obvious. Like, I, seems, I remember it. <laughs> It is so obvious. Like, why don't they, why don't, in the defense of hospitals, there's this, um, and I'll, I'll say this off soft ram, I realize I'm going like a massive tangent. Um, you know, in the defense of hospitals, there are really a few reasons that games don't exist. One of them is a cultural reason. Um, you know, 10 years ago, the idea of a doctor telling a young person to play video games was kind of taboo, you know, because screen time is supposed to be bad, right? Like, don't encourage people to, you know, to be on screen so much. I would argue that screen time isn't necessarily bad. It's like what is on the screen, right? Like if you spend all your time watching cat videos, look, I love a good cat video once in a while too, but like that's going to be a little different than if you're watching TED Talks or you're playing Minecraft and you're a little bit more engaged, right? So I think that alone is just observationally, um, you know, the, just the difference between like disengaged entertainment versus engaged entertainment. I think there's a distinction there to be made. Um, and even that, I'm not, my vocabulary is super broad there as someone's going to come up at me and like start getting into a philosophical de debate and, and nitpicking. But you get the point I'm trying to make here, right? It's like what, what you do on the screen makes a difference. So I think, so there's something to be said about that. Like there was a cultural stigma around games existing in medical environments. Unfortunately, because of that stigma, that's a big reason why games might not exist now. Uh, if had that not been much of a thing, we might be much further ahead than we are. Uh, the other reason, more pragmatically, is cost. It's an expensive proposition to put video games in every single room of a hospital. Um, you know, there was a major hospital last year that had a $1.5 billion operating budget. We work with them. And um, after they got through all their expenses, uh, you know, equipment, salaries, et cetera, they had 500 grand left over to reinvest in the hospital. Now, 500 grand seems like a lot of money, but when you have a $1.5 billion operating budget for your hospital, you know, there's the, the things you're concerned with financing are a bit different. Like you might think, oh, I'm gonna, I need to hire a surgeon. I need to hire like a couple more doctors. We need to like renovate this section of the hospital because it's really outdated. You know, your first thought is probably not to buy a bunch of video games. Now, that's unfortunate, and it comes back to like why this problem exists. Research and treatment are the priorities, and, and I agree with that. You know, If you are in the hospital, the goal is to get out of the hospital. That's the whole point. Um, but again, because of that, quality of life takes a back seat, and it can be difficult for hospitals to rally the resources to provide for those sorts of programs. And that's why a lot of activities in hospitals are managed voluntarily. Oftentimes, if you go into a hospital, the people who are, uh, you know, bringing therapy dogs to the facility, the people who are magicians, the people who are managing like a book program, et cetera, playroom volunteers, they're, they're volunteers. They're doing so um, because out of the goodness of their hearts to help, you know, kids and families out who are going through tough times. And actually during the height of COVID and this pandemic we've been in, a lot of volunteer programs were put on hold because people weren't allowed into hospitals, um, uh, you know, due to concern around COVID spread. So video games are kind of in more demand than ever um, because they were one of the only ways that kids could have access to activities. Um, so there's a third problem as well, which is a management challenge. Even if you install an Xbox console in every room of a hospital, Somebody has to go room to room to update the device, make sure the last patient who used it has wiped any information they've left behind. Uh, because obviously, if like the next kid comes in, maybe they'll try to buy something, right? Maybe they'll be like, oh, I recognize that kid who was in the hospital. And that would be a violation of privacy. Um, maybe a child has downloaded an M rated video game, and the next kid that comes in the hospital, their parents don't want them playing an M rated video game, right? So, 
that's really time consuming. Like if you're a hospital staff member and your job is to like provide care for say 10 kids in a day, you only get to spend so much time with each child, right? And so if I say to you, hey, can you help me update my Xbox? Or hey, can you like unplug the Xbox from the playroom and bring it to me? That creates a lot of time, cons- that, that it sucks up a lot of time for healthcare workers whose job it is to provide care, not necessarily provide tech support. So that's why we exist as a charity. We are you know, trying to fight basically these three battles. One is providing the devices to hospitals, Two is helping them manage those devices. And then three, of course, is you know, pushing back against some of the stereotypes and misconceptions that have existed around games. Um, and again, that, that battle is quite a bit different now because uh, as we've talked about, games are so prevalent. Uh, even my mom has Angry Birds on her cell phone at this point. So I, I think it's, uh, it's just perceived a bit differently than it was when we first started. So anyway, I... Uh, Yes, that's my tangent of the day. <laughs> uh, you've, maybe you have a lot of questions, or maybe we wrap the show. I'm not sure, but uh, that's, uh, that's a, it's a big story of like from start to finish why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, I think that was a pretty all-encompassing answer to how did you get started. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you think if you had a Mortal Kombat tournament, maybe maybe that one officer would have been right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think well. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that's sort of part of the, uh, you know, there's that quote, fate loves irony, and that's certainly been the case in gamers' outreach history on a number of occasions. Uh, and, and, of course, it's very ironic that I started this whole organization based on, you know, one of the most uh, controversial video games, possibly, you know, one of the top five, argue, you know, to, to come out in history. Um, but I think that's part of the point, right? I mean, I grew up playing Mortal Kombat, and now I'm running a children's charity. So what does that tell you, right? If you're citing examples of, like, kids that play video games and then go commit acts of atrocity, you've got to cite all the examples of, you know, all those of us who grew up, you know, playing those games and don't. Uh, and there's a lot more of us than there are of them. So that's, I just think, you know, and even that, it's, it's not even, like, really a... a, a uh, quantitative argument. I mean, it is actually. I mean, numbers-wise, speaks for themselves. But it's it's kind of more of a, 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 a you know. Again, I think there are, there's a long list of things to talk about before you get to video games and, and get to that stuff. So, um, yeah. I mean, even that. I, I and I'm not. I should mention as well. Like, I'm not necessarily a critic of parents making educated decisions around what sort of content they want their kids to listen to or watch or play. Right. I think that that's for sure a healthy conversation to be had. Um, so I, I don't think that's necessarily, you know, anything to like shake a stick at per se. Um, the part I had a disagreement was with was that, you know, we had this very, uh, consensual, well-planned event where, I mean, parents were literally signing consent forms if their kids were under the age of 17 to play these games. Um, and to me, that's an opportunity to engage with young people. I mean, I talk to parents now sometimes they'll ask me like you know what what games do you recommend or how should i think about my child and screen time and i think it's super important to take interest in what your kids are doing i'm not a parent yet but i can tell you my fondest memories are when my dad would sit down with my younger brother and i play video games with us Um, i think that is going to create and harbor much different discussions than if you sort of shame your kids for things that they're into you know um and again, I'm not a parent yet, but I do think generally kids are actually pretty good at figuring out what they're good at. Um, you just sort of have to give them time and some encouragement or suggestions. But, um, you know, I, I think video games are a way to connect with young people, matter of fact. I think they're, they're, they are they present so much opportunity to educate, to inspire, and it really just comes down to how are we approaching this topic uh, as a culture. So um, that's my hot take. Uh, and of course, I'm biased saying this, having grown up in that, that sphere, of like, like all of us. Speaking of connecting with young people through video games, have you ever played with a kid in a hospital who has one of the go-karts and just absolutely destroyed them in whatever game you're playing? Man, I gotta be honest, like, they destroy me. Uh, I cannot keep up with the youths of the world anymore. It's funny, too, because I've seen on Twitter, especially, obviously, like, there's the new Halo coming out uh, this holiday, uh, which... You know, as mentioned, as the was the sort of uh, starting point for gamers outreach. Well, would that and be uh, would that be seen at the next Gamers for Giving event? 
It likely will. I mean, we usually always have tournaments. So, so Gamers for Giving nowadays is a big LAN party. So we'll rent a basketball stadium. We have a bunch of people bring their computers. We lay down network equipment. And then we have a streaming marathon on top of all that. So we'll invite you know, people on from Twitch and YouTube. They'll broadcast from the event. We have folks who broadcast from their homes. Um, and uh, then we also host a variety of activities as well. So we'll have tournaments and stuff that people can compete in. And, and typically, there's always a Halo tournament. Um, we've, we've continued to have Halo tournaments through the years. Um, it's just kind of part of our origin story. And, uh, and it's fun. We like to, to play Halo at Gamers for Giving. We have a lot of folks from the Halo community who come out and support uh, the events, uh, support the cause over the years. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, I mean, it kind of depends on, on how, uh, how infinite, uh, how the infinite multiplayer functions, but it's looking good, I think, from what I've read, and uh, we'd love to have a, a Halo tournament during the event. Um, but yeah, I can't keep up with the youth these days. Uh, I mean, they're, like, dude, I'm, I, my, uh, and also, too, and I've been in a little bit of a hiatus, like, my gaming PC's been unplugged the last couple months, and it's killing me inside, because uh, I'm, like, in the process of moving. And um, so I'm, I'm actually playing, uh, I'm catching up on some Nintendo Switch games. I'm playing Breath of the Wild right now. Um, but I, my, my fingers, dude, I, I just like, I'm, I'm so out of practice. I don't think it would, it would take forever to like get back in shape. Zach, don't tell me you've got boomer reflexes. Dude, it's bad. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it would, just, it would just take like, I mean, for me to get back to some sort of I mean, it's laughable by some people's standards, like competitive standard. Um, I don't think it's possible, uh, you know, given everything going on. So I'll, I'll end up probably watching a lot from afar. Uh, I definitely going to try to play, but I, I, I just haven't played FPS games on controller in so long. Uh, I think it's, it's, I've probably lost the touch at this point. Now, what if they brought in or you brought in Mortal Kombat Deception? What if, what if that was the case? That I weirdly I, I feel like I actually could pick that up and get competitive again only because I had put so much intentional thought into it. Halo I did I did play a lot, but I don't know I was always not despite the hours I put into it. Um, I, I hit a ceiling that I couldn't really surpass, and all my friends ended up. Uh, a lot of the people in the Halo community I would play with regularly were I always felt like they were better than me. So, but Mortal Kombat I that was like for some reason that really clicked with me. I I like to think of fighting games kind of like. They're kind of like rock, paper, scissors, but really fast. Like, you have to kind of, like, know what all the characters do and anticipate it and then know what the counter to that thing is. And then it's kind of just like, uh, it's almost like a very logical game in that way. Like, oh, I see this character is doing that. I'm going to respond with this. I'm going to try to do this. I see he's responding with that. Um, that's at least how I perceived it. And um, I would, dude, I don't know, you're getting me started, man. I would love to actually, like, I mean, especially now with how, e how big esports are, like, if I could only get the time to, like, put in the hours again, I would love to, like, compete at some point. Um, especially in a Mortal Kombat tournament, that would be bad. You know, super, super, super cool to do. So, uh, we'll see. Maybe one day. That would be awesome. I mean, to put it at that event as well, I mean, you've had a, a Peggle 2 event before so i think a, a throwback mortal Kombat event wouldn't be so out of the ordinary <laughs> yeah we have done we actually uh the funny thing of that pagel tournament that sort of emerged from like uh I, I can't take credit for the pagel idea that was this guy these two guys walshy and strong side uh who also are pretty prevalent names in the halo community um they were they're huge fans of this game pagel um and we were all joking around New Year's, like, man, it'd be so fun. We, we spent so much time playing this game. It'd be hilarious to, like, do a tournament for it during Gamers are Giving. We actually found the woman who uh, uh, had made some trophies for Blizzard and, like, their StarCraft esports events. I found her on Etsy. It was so random. Um, and she had, like, posted some, like, esports trophies she had built out of metal. And I reached out to her and was like, oh, my gosh. You have to help us make. We we have this game Pagel. You have to make like the, the most badass trophy for us uh, for our, for our event get, gamers are giving. And she was down to do it. She made a trophy for us for a couple of years. Uh, she made trophies for us for a couple of years, and um, uh, it was so funny. We had like such a great time uh, posting that. And 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 Wall Street Strong Side did a lot of commentating. And there's I think you might be able to still find replays of it somewhere on Twitch. But it was really uh, it, it was pretty hilarious. We took it pretty seriously. That is pretty awesome. So talk to me about the growth of Gamers for Giving over the years. You know, you started pretty small. I mean, 
that Halo event wasn't exactly meant to be Gamers for Giving, but that was your first step into creating big events. Talk to me about the step-by-step -step increase. You know, it really happened organically. Um, I mean, aside from, we, we had some initial press from our event being canceled, which definitely helped spread the word a bit, but um, there are a lot of years of just <laughs> having to get the word out, putting flyers in game stops, you know, building an email list over time, fighting through problems that happened during live events. You know, there was one year where our power went out. There was another year where like the university had scheduled internet maintenance the same weekend as our event. And so like the, which is fit. And that was like a learning of like, sometimes you have to like, any time, well, not sometimes, always. Whenever you're planning an event, you have to go to the source. Like, find the the people who are the source of the internet, the source of the power, and make sure that they are aware, in addition to your venue, that you're hosting a live event. So, you know, we had to fight through some of those challenges, um, you know, that I think a lot of uh, first-time event organizers do go through. Uh, and even seasoned pros. I mean, the Super Bowl had a power outage, right? Like, I think one of the years uh, in the last decade. So. Um, and even when you go to MLG events, I mean, I remember going to MLG events and Battle.net would be down randomly. The whole tournament was delayed. You know, there'd be delay in brackets. Uh, you know, consoles weren't, you know, there was I, natural disaster. So, natural disaster. Are, like, yeah, there was one event. I think it was a, I think it was Columbus. There was like a lot of rain. I could be mistaken. There was an MLG event where there was like a flash flood and the venue, like water started coming into the venue. And, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, dude, if you ever want to talk about, like, crazy event circumstances, you should hit up Adam Apicella. Uh That dude has dealt with all sorts of, like, wildness from events and um, uh, had some, 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 some more stories for sure. It's, it's really wild what they've done. So, anyway, I'll just say that, um, you know, Gamers for Gaming has grown a ton. We started out... Um, uh, in a college ballroom. Now, you know, we host the event in a basketball arena. The event sells out almost instantly when we put tickets for sale, which we're super grateful for. Um, the last couple of years, we've been just doing a virtual event with COVID. I think we'll probably end up coming back full force in 2023. Uh, so next year, we'll likely be online. We're kind of in this weird gray area where like events are starting to come back, but aren't totally back yet like some events you, everyone has to wear a mask you have to show that you're vaccinated or negative covid tests and it just sort of introduces a lot of complications running a land party because we're like literally putting people in this fishbowl and covid aside like land parties it's pretty easy to get the flu anyway like anytime i go to QuakeCon or dreamhack i mean i you know be sneezing a little bit afterwards right so we just want to think we want to make sure that like when we come back we don't have to worry about anything as event organizers related to covid our attendees don't have to worry about anything. Um, and then even just from like a, uh, a sponsorship standpoint, a logistics standpoint, I mean, we have to start planning this stuff now. And it's hard to kind of do that if there's like even a bit of uncertainty given everything that's happened over the last year. So um, anywho, all that to say that uh, we're excited to come back when we will. Um, it is going to happen. Um, anytime we do the virtual event, it's great. The community has shown up in a really big way. I think that's been probably... One of the most remarkable areas of growth is just seeing all the incredible support from streamers, um, you know, people from all different aspects of the gaming community, people of very diverse backgrounds and beliefs really coming together to help us make this impact in hospitals. And what's so great about the work we do is oftentimes people who fundraise are able to support their local hospitals. Um, we try to give donors their, we try to respect a donor's preference if they raise money to uh, make our programs possible. So. Um, that's probably been the, the most incredible thing over the last few years, particularly, especially as we've like had to do this virtual event with COVID. Um, I don't know that we'll actually end up expanding the physical event. I mean, we our tickets sell instantly, which again, we're super grateful for. Um, I think we could definitely up our seat count, but the question then becomes for us, like, does upping the seat count really change anything? Like, um, it actually kind of introduces a lot more expenses. It might make charitable fundraising harder. Uh, we would have to spend a bunch of money investing in the equipment to do it. Um, and we're just not quite sure if it would really, like I, to me, I'd rather invest in like a more polished experience than like a larger one, at least for what we do. Um, that's the kind of the current line of thinking. Um, that's to say, I think we're like the third largest land in North America behind QuakeCon and DreamHack. So it's kind of funny to think that like, 
this police officer like shut down the tournament <laughs> when I was in high school and has like subsequently spurred the existence of the event that we host now. So um, yeah, it's super cool. I mean, we're really grateful to do it. I love hosting the LAN party. I think it's as much as of our identity as is the programs we have. Um, it's just a really great way to get the community together for us to play video games and do what we love and um, you know, raise some money while we're at it. So we have a great time and can't wait to bring it back. I'm, I'm pretty excited for it to, to return. I'm definitely interested to see what you guys continue to do with the future, but have you ever reached out or has that police officer ever reached out to you and said like, hey, you were right? <laughs> you know, it's funny because he, even the way I tell a story, like he kind of ends up being the villain in the story, but actually he's a really nice guy, funny enough. And, and again, this is where like some of the nuance comes into play. Like um, he, I think he meant well. I don't know that he really understood what was happening or what was going on. And again, there were a lot of like misconceptions around games and whatnot at that time. Um, my parents are like, uh, 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 you know, faith is pretty important to them in their personal lives. And so it turns out that this guy goes to like the same church that they go to. So they've definitely, I think, had some conversations with them and. Uh, and he's like a pleasant person. I mean, he, I think he means well, generally. Uh, it just so happened, like, you know, it was, I think there was just sort of like a few knee jerks. Re- jer- there were a few knee jerk reactions that happened, and it created this like really special circumstance that led to our event being canceled. And I, I think, again, that's been sort of an eye opening thing for me over the years is just kind of realizing like, Sometimes things that are written about in the press are a little different in reality, but like people will read the article and get kind of spun up about a thing. Um, and sometimes rightfully so. I mean, in our case, it was still ridiculous that our event got canceled. Um, but it wasn't necessarily that I think the people involved had bad intentions, um, you know, per se. But maybe I'm being too friendly about it. I, I, I obviously like it created all the incredible work we do now. So it's hard to like. I literally don't think about it at all. Uh, I tell the story <laughs> only because it's, I think it's something that still resonates with a lot of us in gaming. And um, it's a fun, or I, I think our origin story is, uh, is kind of cinematic in some way. So it's, it's fun to revisit, but otherwise I, I literally don't think about it day to day. And it's even more full circle too. I mean, nowadays, um, uh, you know, our high school, the high school where we were founded has even reached out and kind of recognized the work that we, we've done. And, and people in my high school as well were generally supportive. It just so happened we had this, like, situation where some of the uh, folks in administration didn't quite know what was happening. But, like, my teachers were very supportive. My friends were very supportive. My guidance counselor was actually the one I told her the idea that I wanted to host a video game tournament. She was super encouraging and was really the one that um, uh, convinced me to, to try to make it happen. So, um so yeah it's there's zero hard feelings and if the guy i'm sure he knows about us he has to at this point um but uh you know it's not like it's not like uh he's reached out and with any sort of spite or whatnot (laughs) imagine him just getting a message like i still think i was right you're corrupting the kids in the hospitals (laughs) you know in fairness people are entitled to their opinions i mean that's that's kind of my (laughs) advice like you know there's there's definitely folks in the world who um, aren't fans of video games. I mean, there are people who maybe hear about what we do and they don't think it should be a priority, right? And that's fair. It's fair for people to say, like, look, you know, maybe maybe you are really passionate about helping uh, animals in animal shelters or, like, adoption facilities. That's great. Go do that. I mean, we, we tell people all the time, like, you know, what we're, we believe what we're doing is important and critical for a number of reasons and you know as a lifelong video game enthusiast this is how i take the things that i know about and the things that i'm interested in and channel that energy in a way that is hopefully being helpful to other people and productive um and so that's what i like to do i think there are people who know a lot about other things in the world and i hope they dedicate the end their energies to those things if our cause isn't of interest so uh, but for those of us, you know, who get it, those out there who are listening that understand the work we do, you know, we invite anybody to be a part of us. Um, you know, it's wonderful when people get the chance to join our work and, and make a difference. And, um, you know, we're super excited to do it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm still as passionate about it as, as I was when we started. Uh, I hope it exists indefinitely. Um, you know, I hope Gamers Average continues to do good in the world. Um, I think as I get older, like sometimes personally, I try, I'm now, now that I'm a bit older, I try to separate like my personal life a little bit more from Gamers I Reach. Uh, I think when I was starting it, it felt like a bit more of an all-in endeavor. Uh, 
and definitely like uh you know there's definitely some things i had to like quote you know sacrifice along the way to like you know get gamers to where it was and, and friends as well a lot of volunteers had to you know put in long hours to make what we do possible um and now i try to be a little bit more respectful and i also try to protect my team as well i try to make sure that they are taking breaks and um uh you know maintaining a healthy work-life balance because it's so easy for us to i think get wrapped up in what we're doing because it does feel so meaningful and it is so fun to be a part of um it's it's easy to like just keep going like every single day want to turn your laptop on and get to work but it's super important to recharge and uh you know take some time to be creative and explore other interests too so um so yeah we're really happy to do this work and and it's so exciting to to you know see the com- the, the gaming community rally behind in the way that they have well, it's awesome to see all the incredible work you do for kids and the gaming community at large. But before we sign off, I have to ask you about Detroit Pizza Depot. Quick, tell me what it is. 60 second pitch. 60 seconds. All right. Well, Detroit Pizza Depot is uh, it's going to be the greatest pizza experience people in the West Coast have ever had. Um, so Detroit style pizza is a particular type of pizza that I'm finding out is really mostly known only in Michigan. Uh, it comes in like a square shape. It's kind of like a brownie, but in pizza form. Uh, the reason they call it Detroit style is that back in like the 60s, there were these guys who got home from World War II. They were trying to recreate focaccia bread they had had in Italy, but they didn't have any square shaped pans. So to solve this problem, they took oil pans from the car factories they worked, cleaned them out, and tried to recreate focaccia bread. But when it popped out, it was sort of like this pizza type food to eat. And uh, because of the way the pan is shaped, all the cheese bleeds into the edges and creates this like caramelized crust. So it's really delicious. Like when you get to the crust, the crust is the payoff in Detroit style pizza. So I moved to LA like six years ago and realized there's not really anybody making good Detroit style pizza in LA. I think I found one or two people in all of LA County, which is like 10 million people. Whereas back in Michigan, we've got it like it's so common. You know, we don't even think about it growing up. So. Um, it's just a passion project. I mean, I do think we're, we're, we're hoping to build a massive pizza empire for sure. Um, that is the goal. Like, I, I actually think I want to call the, the parent company, like pizza mega corp, just to like, you know, <laughs> just, uh, just put the poster board up on the wall. But I reached out to a friend of mine. Um, he started a pizza truck, uh, and his pizza is killer. Uh, he's been doing this kind of like on his own. He makes really delicious pizza. We're going to, um, He's gonna. He's putting his pizza truck in storage. He's gonna move to Los Angeles, and we're gonna open up our first kitchen probably like April, May next year. So right now we're like taking photos. We're kind of like slowly working on our marketing stuff. We're gonna do some tasting parties, and then um, we're gonna open in LA. And then I'd like us to open in Seattle, uh, Miami, maybe Oklahoma City. Um, and my younger brother lives in Vegas. We're thinking about Vegas as well. Uh, so we, we have a whole plan we're working on and we're pretty amped about it. But I, I'm not going to be making the pizzas. I, I've told him, like, I'm really committed to Gamers Outreach. Uh, you know, Geo is like what I, you know, it's my life's work. And um, so thankfully, though, he's really passionate about pizza. And I'm really passionate about telling people about pizza So and eating pizza. So the hope is that I'm going to kind of, like, be the hype man and um, help us, like, get the word out. And then he's going to, like, actually kind of run the, the, the day-to-day operations and such. So... Um, yeah, I think Detroit's first great export was the automobile and our next will be pizza. So it's coming, coming soon. Well, I'm definitely excited to hear more about that, but my mom in the chat offered a great question. What about gluten-free? See myself, I, uh, I follow that strict diet. Will I have any options at Detroit Pizza Depot? Yeah, Yeah, it turns out actually, uh, Detroit style pizza. I think it's easier to make gluten-free pizza with Detroit style than it is some of the others because like. The way you uh, put the dough in the pans, it doesn't really cross-contaminate as much. So, uh, Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Do you ever make it to Los Angeles? I have gone there once, and it was interesting that you brought up that you've made friends online. The first time I went out to L.A. was meeting a friend I met online, and that was the first time I ever went to L.A., first time I ever met him. So I, I think L.A. is pretty sick. I'm out here. The studio is based right here in uh, Brooklyn. But uh, I definitely got to make some more trips out, especially when we get that first brick and mortar location so I could pull up and have a a nice brownie of pizza. (laughs) Make this happen. (laughs) 
That sounds amazing, but unfortunately, this conversation has to come to a close. As sad as it is, every episode we get, while it comes in amazing, it has to go away just as nice. Now, before we send this episode off, where can the people at home find you and Gamers Outreach? Or get involved, gamersoutreach.org. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, at gamersoutreach as well. Uh, my personal handle, Zach Weigel. Um, and I don't always tweet about Gamers Outreach. Sometimes you'll see random aphorisms or uh, talk about pizza, so fair warning. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, but I actually have to say you catfished me a little bit, Zach. I thought you had a lot more hair. That was the picture I yeah. used. I didn't know you were coming in with a fresh cut. I've been bamboozled, but it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I need to I need to swap that out. That was my, uh, my pandemic bro flow uh, going on there, so I haven't, I haven't changed my, my picture yet. <laughs> No worries, it is A-OK, -okay. and now when we send this off, we always have to send it to a friend of the show, if if one of them is currently on. Yes, we got one right now, we're going to send this episode off.